later. This would not be. So we're going to Jeremiah 1. Oh, how he loves me. See, we've got to get that in my spirit. It is hard to get depressed and upset and believe that nothing is happening in my life if I can grasp the fact that God loves me. Because what else matters? If he loves me and I have covenant with God and his promises are yes and amen and he can't lie, what in the world can I be depressed about? Can the devil beat me? No. Can my job defeat me? No. Can there not be provision? No, because it says what? He will meet and supply all of your needs according to my riches from my job. No, from his riches and his glory. The Jeremiah 1, and we won't, I want to cover the whole chapter today, but I'm just going to be honest. I'm not reading all these names. Okay? But I want you to go down to verse 4. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. There's a tie here that I'm going to show you something of God's love today. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. See, forming in the womb was once the seed entered the egg, there's something that began to form, a fetus. But God's saying before that, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you and have appointed you a prophet to the nations. We know he's talking about Jeremiah. Jeremiah came as a little boy. Do you guys know the story? And he began to prophesy unto what? Another king. Another prophet. And they began to prophesy at a young age. And they prophesied and they prophesied for one purpose. To save the church. To save the church. To bring it out of ruins. Verse 6. Then I say, Alice, Lord, God, behold, do not... I do not know how to speak. Do we sound like Moses here again? Yes, sir. Here we come. Wait a minute. You called me. You have brought me from when? Before conception. Before conception, you knew me. You had consecrated me to become a prophet. You knew all about me, but you didn't know I wouldn't know how to speak. He knew that too. I'm not good enough. I can't hold this position, nor can I hold this title or do this job in which you consecrated me to before my parents got together, before the foundations of the earth, that you planned something in my life that you knew that I would not be able to do. Impossible. Impossible, right? It couldn't happen. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth. Don't make excuses. And how many of us make excuses? 
I don't think there's not an excuse that Lord ain't heard and hadn't left. There's nothing new under the sun. But we all make excuses. I work too much. My job just doesn't allow me to do that. I'm just not one of those type of people. I'm not bold enough. I can't do that. We make excuses. Because everywhere I send you, you shall go. And all that I command you, you shall speak. For I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched the mouth and said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Seeing I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to pluck up and to break down and destroy and to overthrow, to build up, to plant. Verse 12. Then the Lord said to me, I have sent well, for I watch over you, my words to perform it. Before the foundations of the earth. Before you were conceived. Before you were formed. Who destinated a place and a job for you. I called you to it. I put my knowledge and my words in you. And then I sent you out before you were ever born, before you were ever conceived. And I won every battle that would ever come into your life. Or if mama ever knew your name. Well, mommy and daddy were still wondering, do I have a boy or do I have a girl? God said, I already have a plan. It's in place. And there's nothing on this earth that can stop it. Because I've already put it into place. I've ordained it to happen. We know the story goes on and it says that the Lord appeared to him. And he says, what do you see? And he tells him, he sees him. And then again, it comes to him again. And it's what he's seeing is the ruins. What he's seeing is the destruction. What he's seeing is what's going to happen. Verse 17, now gird up your loins and arise and speak to them all which I have commanded. Not suggested. There's no suggestions going on here. I've commanded them up here. Do not be dismayed for before them or I will dismay you before them. Meaning don't doubt. Don't think there's something else going on. There is no one or no situation that can keep you from moving. God's already said you're going to move, Leanne. There's nothing that can stop it but you. See, God's got a plan. It's God's time. Verse 19. They will fight against you, but they will not overcome you. For I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Can we say that in our lives today?
for I am with you. So how about that? How about if we say this together? For Lord, you are with me. me to, deliver. to deliver me, declares the Lord. Can we get that in our spirit today? Lord, you are with me to deliver me, to move me, to set my captives free, to bring my family back to, to the Lord. You're with me. You are the power. All I have to do is speak your name. But I have to believe it. I have to hold on to it. So let's look at, again, it's not a typical message, so you don't have four points. You've got eight, seven points, I think, today. <laughs> Point one. God knew him, or God knows him. And God knows you. You can put me. You can put whatever you want to put in that box, but Your God name. knows you. Let's flip over to Deuteronomy 18. The Lord God will rise you up from the prophet like me, from among you, from the countrymen. You shall listen to him. This is according to all that has been asked of the Lord your God on Hebron. On the day of the assembly saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God. Let me not see this great fire anymore or I will die the Lord said to me they will they have spoken well I will rise up a prophet from amongst them amongst the countrymen like you and I shall put my words in his mouth and he shall speak them all that I command him who's doing it this is Jeremiah over in Deuteronomy, God speaking it to what? To the prophet saying, I am going to rise up Jeremiah someday out of the countrymen. See, this is all part of the plan. It's before the foundations of the earth. It's before Jeremiah was conceived. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak them all that I command him. What words are you going to speak? All the words that he was told to speak. Can we say that in our own lives? That I speak all that God tells me to speak. I do all that God asks me to do. Turn over to Psalms 139. I want to show you that God knew you, Nancy. He knew everything that Nancy would go through. As bad as that was, but I had a I'm going to bring Nancy through it, and I'm going to bring her through victorious. I'm going to bring her through stronger. And in her latter days, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon that girl. And that girl is going to prophesy. That girl is going to bring people to Christ. That girl is going to change nations. Because I predestined it way back before she was ever conceived. And I'm going to bring it to pass. Psalms 139, 16 through 18 says, your, your eyes have seen my unformed substance. See, when I talked about the seed and the egg, it's unformed. It's not 
It's not an embryo at this point. And in your books were all written the days that were ordained for me. When was your life written down in the books? Did you see that? Are you seeing what I'm showing you? This is not our decision. This is God's decision that he has called you. Before the unformed substance, your name, the orders, the ordination was written down in the books. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sands. When I awake, I am still with you. What is he talking about? Did he tell someone about sand on the ground? Did he tell someone about you can't count the stars? So when Abram, before he ever became Abraham, was making covenant with God because God knew all the days of Abraham, God says, hey, Abraham, father of many nations, you won't be able to count the sand. You won't be able to count the stars because those are your descendants, both Greek or Hebrew and, and Gentile, Jew and Gentile, both of those, the sand and the stars are all in your grasp because I've made you the father of many nations. So when did it happen? Before the foundations of the earth, God knew. Let's flip over to Romans 8 and 29. There's something in this, and I've read this thing many, many, many times, but there's something that struck me yesterday and today, as I was reading this and preparing, that I've never really looked at before. For those whom he foreknew. What does that mean? Before then. Clear back here again, before the unformed substance, that person that I foreknew, he also predestined to become conform to the image of God so that he would be the firstborn amongst the brethren. We've all read it like that, right? We've all seen it. Now let's look at it again. Read it again. Don't I read it to me. What is it really saying? For those he, whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. What are you seeing, guys? Maybe this is just revelation for God to me, but I need you to see. There's something about being the image of his son. Who gets that? Those that he foreknew. Only the ones that he predestined. He foreknew everyone. So the ones that he predestined, the ones that knew that he knew would make decisions for him, knows. He made into the image and likeness of God, which means he gave you, what's the image of God? The, the light. The light. He made you to bear light. See, not everyone's a light bearer. 
Satan was a light bearer until he was cast out of heaven. And that was the light was stripped from him and he became darkness. So not everyone that is born has the light. Nor can they shed the light. Only those that he foreknew, that he predestined, was born with the image of God. Point two. He sanctified him. How did he do that? Set him apart. Set him apart, right? Mm -hmm. And he will do what to me? Sanctify. He has to sanctify you before the beginning of time because he has already set you apart to do a certain thing. So let's go to Galatians 1, 15 and 17. Donna? Sure. But when God, who had set me apart, even from my mother's womb, and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me, so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with fresh flesh and blood. Has he set you apart? But when God, who had set me apart, even from my mother's womb, and called me through his grace. See, we're thinking somehow from the front to the back that I'm living my life. I was born Again, this, and, and, and that's how I see my life. I see my life from a child to where I am today. And I see all the trials and the situations that I've been through. And I begin to weigh those towards where I am going. That's how I see life. I can't see life any other way because I haven't lived tomorrow. But see, God's looking the other direction. Because he knew the back of the book before the front of the book was ever written. And so before the beginning of time, it says that he was what? Slain before the foundations of the earth. He already knew what he had to do. He already knew what price he had to pay. He already knew what decisions Gary would make. He already knew what decisions Kim would make. He already knew what decisions Leanne would make. He knew where every one of our situations were and how we would live it. And then he recorded it into the books. And it was at that point that God knew that you became predestined and you were made in the likeness in the image of God. Able to bear light. Able to bring life forth from your lips because he had already spoken them into your life. Point three. God ordained him and God has Ordained the, ordained the he has given us a job and a purpose Romans 9 and 21 says or does not the potter have the right over the clay to make from the same 
lump or the one vessel, the one clump of clay? Does he not have the right or the honorable use to make two different things? It's his clay. It's his form. He can form it. He can, he can make it anything he wants to make it. He's sitting at the wheel, potter's wheel and he's got the choice. He's ordained us. He's called us. Point four says God sent him and God shall send you. Mark 15 and 16. And he said unto them, Go unto all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. So there wasn't a choice. Even when he came at Pentecost and he was meeting with his disciples, there was no choice. I've already chosen you. I've already picked you. I've already selected you. I've already taken you through the training. And now you shall go and you shall preach the gospel. But the great part was, just like with Jeremiah, he didn't just tell him to go. He told him to wait till I come. Wait till I bring you the comforter. Wait till I bring you the power of the Holy Ghost. Wait until I equip you. Or in Jeremiah's case, he said what? Till I put the words in your mouth. Till I equip you with the words. That'll go forth from your mouth as I commanded them. There was something going on. No one gets to do it by themselves. Nobody gets to do it their way. These aren't your words. They're not your teachings. They're not some college teachings. They're not some degree you had. You have to do it God's way in God's words. Five says, God commanded him and God has commanded you. Let's flip over to Deuteronomy 5 and 33. It's a little bit of a Bible drill today. But I want to show you how much God can shake. That you weren't just an accident. It just didn't so happen be that God took pity on you. He loves you. He chose you. He's given you the formula. You shall walk in all the ways in which the Lord, your God, has commanded you. That you may live and that you may be well, that it may be well with you and that you may prolong your days in the land in which you possess. We're not talking about heaven. We're not talking about eternity. We're talking about your days right now on this earth, in the Old Testament, That you shall walk in all the ways in which the Lord has, thy God has suggested that you might do. They're not suggestions. The Lord commanded unto Jeremiah what to do, how to do it, when to do it, and what to say. The words in which I gave you. They will bring life. They will set the captives free. They will heal. 
And we sang that song just a little while ago. He knows my name. Turned around and we sang, Speak Jesus. For Jeremiah, he spoke Jesus. For all the prophets through the Old and New Testament, they spoke Jesus. For Jesus himself, when Jesus came here and walked on the earth, he spoke Jesus. He spoke the words of his father. And he's trying to command, tell us that, you know what? This is my commandment. You do it my way. If you do it my way, that you may prolong your days in the land in which you possess. Point six. God encouraged him. Be not afraid. Fear is not of God. Hebrews 13 and 6 says, so that we conf confidentially. confidentially say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? What can man do to you? Can anyone at that house rob you of your joy? Can they take Jesus from you? Can they rob you from the healing that he has set you free? No, they cannot. Now I can allow them to put me into a bad mood. I can allow other people to change my attitude. I'm good at confessing things, so I don't mind saying it. There's lots of times in life that I look back and said how foolish I was to have allowed a person or a thing or an object to change my disposition. How could I allow myself to get so upset? Over the fact that the vacuum didn't work right. That I could swear and curse before the Lord and let it change my whole day. Or how about a flat tire? Or... Or a bump on my brand new car. Or any other thing. Could it happen? I remember when I got my th this car out here. My dad, I took my dad's car when he passed away. Had, I mean, he always kept his cars in such great shape. He had this Honda Accord. And he, he literally had an inch and a half on both sides to get his car in and out of the garage. That's it. Nobody else could move his car because he's the only guy that could move it and he never put a scratch in the car. I'm being honest. He did put something in the back bumper somewhere else, but not in that garage. Didn't not happen. in that garage. My dad takes ill. I have got him in hospice. I've got to take him to the hospital one day. And I've had that car in and out of there 50 times. But that day, Somebody had been in the garage and pulled something off the shelf and I couldn't see it. It was sticking out. I am not seeing, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm looking, there's nothing. I got out of that garage and sure enough. So it probably just storm something, you know, shifted. earthquake shifted something. something. Shifted. Sticking out of the side. Put this stupid little dent there. It was there until Michael towed the car. So mad. Like that car had no spots on it whatsoever. 
so mad that that spot was on there. But this car had no spots on it. It wasn't two weeks I had that car, brand new car. I came out. Is that really a door ding? Like someone just went, Whoa. hmm. Yep. <laughs> I had it fixed last year when I had a little accident. So I figured I might as well take pay to get that one out of there too. But it was so upsetting to think that an object, a little scratch, could change your whole demeanor. I've no scratches in the car. What do I need that in there for? But see, Satan came in with that little scratch, little door ding. I ranted probably for two weeks. Every time I went to the car, I would look at it like, well, I mean, oh, 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 it was this big. But it changed me. It upset me. It got to me. And yet we look at these situations in our lives and we say, mm. <laughs> how can they control me? How can it do that? How can we lose focus of God that way? No armor. <laughs> Even the man is still the spirit. <laughs> and yet we all do it. We can't be afraid. He's our helper. He walks us through things. We got to trust him. <laughs> Seven. God's speaking through him. But I have put my word in the mouth. See, the power that he was talking about in the song earlier, speak in the name of Jesus. For you and I will say Yeshua, but there is no greater power. There is no greater name. There is no greater thing that goes on than the son, the name of the son of God. He has been given all power and all But that's what should be in my mouth. That's what should be in my thought process. That's what should come out in every situation. When the reports come, when the darts come, when the trials and the situations of life come, it is the word of God that comes out of it. Because it wins. Because he put it there. Because he sent it to do what? To take down the enemy. To take down the strongholds. Do you remember the end of Jeremiah? What did we just say back there? Does he know me? They will fight against you, but they will not overcome you. For I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. That I declare or what God declares? God declares against and declares it. It's got to happen. It's got to happen. See, but we've got to use the formula. First and foremost, in every one of our lives, we got to understand that this life of mine was ordained by God. He loved me before the foundations of the earth. He wrote down the plan in the book. He put my name down. He told me how I was going to act and what I was going to do. And he knew it. And he wasn't looking at it. all the other messes that I've made out of my life in the 60 years. He could care less. How do I finish the race? Wasn't looking at my failures. He's looking at my success. 
And that's what he was looking at in Jeremiah. Yeah, you're a little boy, but don't tell me you're a youth. Just go do what I told you to do. I've already equipped you. I've already told you how to do it. I've already placed you in a place where you can conquer because I'm with you. Isaiah 51 and 16. I have put my words in your mouth. And I have covered you with the shadows of my hand. To establish the heavens, to find the earth, to say to Zion, you are my person. You are my child. You are my people. I am yours and you are mine. You belong to me. Can we see that? Jeremiah belonged to God. But Jeremiah doesn't belong to God any more than Jesus. Are you telling me that we're predestinating and that our word is our free will? You have a free will, but he already knew before the foundations of the earth what you would do. We're getting to that at a different point. No, you were, according to scripture, you were predestined by God. Will just did that. Sure did. Your will did. And I can get into that later. But even though your free will got in there, he still knew that you would accomplish all who will predestined your knowledge. It's just to be in heaven. And there's a difference of who and how he made you that person on the potter's wheel based on your decision. Because again, he's looking at the back of the ball. He's looking at your finish line. See, I can't see my finish line. Paul says that I run the race how? To get a participation award? Win. No participation awards in heaven. You either ran it to win or you're lukewarm and I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. You get to the finish line and say, well, you know, I did the best I could. It's not good enough. Did you do it my way? See, these are commandments of God. He didn't give us a choice. He gave us a choice to choose him. But once I chose him, the choosing's over. I got to do it his way. So we, like Jeremiah, were chosen. We, like Jeremiah, have been given an order. We, like Jeremiah, have been given a commandment and an assignment and told what to do with it. We're not. He shapes you. That's what happens so let's close. Because honestly, even though we're all believers, even though we have made the Lord our ruler of our life, he wants to take us to the next level. And it's a lot chance different between you. Out of each one of us. Go to that next level. There's going to be some pruning going on. There's going to be some things that the Lord has said. You know what? I've seen it in your life. And I've accepted it long enough. But it's got to go now. That's got to go. I've loved you. I've watched you come through it. But we're going to the next level. Because he's already prophesied over this church where we're supposed to be going. But that means we all have to get up there. 
I may have to be on the Daniel fast with you. He doesn't do things by accident. He's calling us to a new place, to a new dimension. I don't ever want to pray for one more person that doesn't receive healing. That's my heart. Not my batting average, that it be God's batting average. That I'll pray for another person that doesn't get healed. Because his word says he's willing. It's not about my past. It's not about how good I am or how bad I am. It's about how good he is. And am I willing to sacrifice what it's going to take to get there? Because you know what? I have to live a certain way to get there, to accomplish that. Why? Because that's obedience. He's ordained us with the purpose to be obedient. Does it mean more prayer time? Absolutely. Does it mean more quiet time? Absolutely. Does it mean more time in the Word? Absolutely. It's all in where I want to go. It's all in where you want to go. He's given you a plan. You may not know it, but it's clear that he's wrote the plan down. There are people that get to heaven and we can shut this off. You don't have to do that. There are people that get to heaven that are not going to accompany everything that God wanted them to do. Now, that doesn't mean they don't love Jesus. It just means they didn't get everything they wanted to. Mm -hmm. 